If you want to learn more about implementing dynamic VPNs, just sign up for our advanced Juno security course. For full details, just visit juniper.net slash courses and search for the course. Or you can just click on that fancy box that just popped up. Either way, it's time for your learning bite. Hello, my name is Zach Gibbs and I'm a content developer within education services inside Juniper Networks. And today we will be discussing the implementing dynamic VPNs learning byte. All right, at this point you might be asking yourself, why use dynamic VPNs? What does this get me? And the answer to that question is secure remote access. Dynamic VPNs is all about allowing a remote individual to securely access internal corporate resources. Okay, so let's jump to the example. Here in this example we have a remote worker who's connecting into his small office or home office router which connects to the internet. And then we have the SRX1 device that is the gateway device for the corporate network. On this device we have two interfaces, Gigi002 which is the external interface and its associated IP address and the Gigi001 interface and its associated IP address. Then we have the Server1 and Server2 devices and their associated IP addresses. So in our example we have our remote worker who needs to access the corporate internal resources and this remote worker sometimes works from home sometimes other places too so we need to configure SRX1 to use dynamic VPN to allow access to server 1 however we don't want to allow access to server 2 then all traffic including internet based traffic must be routed through the VPN for the remote worker if that remote worker is connected to the VPN so basically what I'm getting at there is no split tunneling so let's go ahead and jump to the CLI alright so the first thing we want to configure is we want to configure an access profile with this access profile we will be configuring local authentication alternatively you can configure radius authentication and I highly recommend configuring the radius authentication if you have a medium to large enterprise that you are doing this for and we'll configure a client. We'll name this client lab. Now we're configuring an address assignment pool that we haven't configured yet. We'll do that in the next step. Now we need to configure the pool parameters. With this, when somebody connects to the VPN, they will get an IP address from this range. Right there, I configure some X auth attributes, and a primary DNS is very important if we are going to disable split tunneling, because this is the DNS that we are going to tell the remote worker to use instead of whatever other DNS they have configured. And so if we try to do no split tunneling and don't specify an X auth attributes, they're going to have troubles resolving DNS. And so next we're going to look at the uh, IKE configuration. Now I've already pre-configured this to save some time. I do want to point out a few things however. Notice that we are using mode aggressive or the aggressive mode and that is because we don't know what that remote workers external IP address is going to be and even if we did he's mobile. He could go to a coffee shop or somewhere else which would change his external IP address so we have to set that to aggressive mode and then in the gateway we have the dynamic option configured. Uh, we're setting that to use a host name. We could use some other type of dynamic dynamic configuration and then we have the X auth profile reference that's very important for dynamic VPNs you have to have that referenced and we configured that earlier with that access profile 
and with IPsec, just a basic IPsec configuration here. Uh, nothing out of the ordinary. We configured a policy and then configured a VPN. We're going to jump into the dynamic VPN hierarchy. Reference the access profile we configured earlier. And then we're just going to configure for, you know, we're just going to call this clients all for this group. And before I configure the no split tunneling part, I want to show you with split tunneling first, just to show the difference there. And we'll configure the IPsec VPN that we configured earlier and reference user lab. Next, we'll need to configure some security policies. So we'll be coming in the untrust zone, going to the trust zone. Now with this, this is a little different, but you have to set the match to a source of any, a destination of any, and an application of any. And reference that IPsec VPN that we configured earlier. The thing I also want to point out here is that this is a catch-all policy. So anything that's coming from the untrust zone to the trust zone is going to hit this policy. And this policy has to be configured this way for dynamic VPN. More than likely in any corporate or real world environment, you're not going to want to leave it like that. So I recommend that you apply some more specific granular policies before this policy to block traffic you don't want showing up and uh, being processed uh, by the SRX device for IPsec. All right, so one last thing we need to do. Configure the untrust zone with IKE and HTTPS. It needs to accept those two types of traffic to be able to process traffic for the dynamic VPN. Let's jump to the remote worker device. All right, so here's the machine for the remote worker. This is a Windows 7 machine, and we're going to first look at the route table. We see that we have a default route, and we have uh, a route for the 10.10.10.0 network. That's his local network that connects him to his home office router, and that's about it, some other miscellaneous routes. So let's try to actually ping those internal resources. Server 1, of course not reachable. Same thing with Server 2, that's what we expect. That should not be reachable unless he's logged into the VPN. So the first things we need to do is go to the address associated with the external interface for SRX1 and then log in using our credentials. And this downloads Juno's Pulse and installs it. And so I'm going to pause the video while it does that, because this will take a few minutes. All right, so that has finished downloading and installing, and it automatically attempts a connection to our SRX1 device. So let's go ahead and connect, and we have to enter our user credentials. And I want to point out that we'll have to enter this twice, but that's for the first time only. All subsequent times that a user connects to the VPN, they will only have to enter their credentials once. And the reason behind that is the first one sets up the IKE Phase 1 Security Associations. The second one sets up the Phase 2 IPsec Security Associations. And so we're done there, and we can close this window. That was only necessary for downloading and installing the Pulse client. We can see here that we have a connection which is what we want. So let's look at the route table. Notice there's a bit of a difference here. First of all, we have the 10.1.1.0 network, and that points through the VPN. But we don't have a new default route, and we haven't set that up yet. So we'll see that as we go along. So let's ping those internal servers. Server 1 looks good. And server 2 is reachable, but we don't want that, so we'll have to make some changes there. And one last thing I want to point out is how the connection to the internet is working. And what I want to show you there is that we're not using the VPN. The SRX1 device is not showing up in that path right now, and that's expected. So let's jump back to the CLI. All right, so here's the CLI. We can see we have the remote protected resources that we configured. We want to uh, exclude a resource. That will be server 2. We're back at the workstation for the remote worker. And we need to disconnect first because nothing will change unless we disconnect and reconnect. Now we look at the route print. 
we can see that there's a new route for the 10.1.1.11 host and we can see that it's pointing towards the 10.10.10.189 gateway so we're basically telling them don't use the VPN for that address and we can't reach that address now we can't reach server 2 and that's expected that's what we want we still can reach server 1 awesome so let's jump back to the CLI basically we said everything is remote protected resource except for that one resource so of course we need to disconnect and then reconnect and now let's look at that route table and notice we have a new default gateway or new default route and this new route is saying we go to the 10.100.100.11 interface that's going through the VPN so that's cool let's actually try a trace route to Google Uh, this is not a good sign. Okay, we couldn't resolve the DNS, so let's just try to ping an address on the internet. And we're not reaching it. And so let's leave that ping running so we can troubleshoot it. All right, so let's look for ICMP packets. We don't have any. And that's indicative of a policy issue. You have to think about where is this coming in from? coming in from the untrust zone and trying to leave the untrust zone. We don't have a policy for that. And you don't have to set this as a wide open policy as I did. For time's sake, we're not going to lock that down, but you can lock this down further just in case. So let's commit that and uh, we're still getting requests timed out. Let's look at the ICP pack, ICMP and Hey, we got we got stuff here. We got sessions. This is a good sign. But look at this. We're coming from that 100.100.11 address, going to 8.8.8.1, and then the response is going to that same internal address, an external IP address like that. It's never going to be able to find that internal IP address. So it seems like a NAT issue now. And notice here we have from interface Gigi001 to interface Gigi002. However, if we look at the session, we see that Gigi002 is the input and output. So let's commit that. Hey, look at that. We have responses. Great. Let's jump back to the workstation. Try to do a trace route to Google. This is looking much better. Notice how that first hop is the address of SRX1's Gigi002 interface. All right, then it's going out to the internet. Awesome, that's what we want to see. I'm going to cancel that. We don't need to see more. And so now we have that no split tunneling working great. We have access to the internal server one and not to server 2 on the corporate network. That's exactly what we set out to do. All right, so that brings us to the end of this learning byte. We talked about dynamic VPNs, and we showed a demonstration on how to configure and kind of do some troubleshooting, too, with dynamic VPNs. So hopefully this is helpful to you in your daily work, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit the Juniper Education Services website to learn more about courses. View our full range of classroom, online, and e-learning courses. Learning paths, industry segment and technology specific training paths. Juniper Networks Certification Program, the ultimate demonstration of your competence. And the training community, from forums to social media, join the discussion.